Mother, I see that you were drawing a line in the sand. And I want to be standing on your side, holding your hand. So let your kingdom come. Let it live in me. This is my prayer. This is my plea. Let the worshipers arise. Let the sons and the daughters sing. Surrender in my all. I surrender to the King. Let the worshippers arise. Let the sons and the daughters sing. I surrender in my all. I surrender to the King. Father, I hear it growing louder, the song of your redeemed. As the saints of every nation are awakening to sing, from our hearts there comes an anthem. Oh, hear the heavens ring, this is our song, a song to our King. Let the worshippers arise, let the sons and the daughters sing. I surrender in my all. I surrender to the King. Let the worshipers arise. Let the sons and the daughters sing. I surrender in my all. I surrender to the King. Surrender in my all. I surrender to the King. Well, I'm tired and so weary, but I must go along till the Lord comes and calls me away.
Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you out. We've got visitors with us again. We're glad to have them with us always. We're studying the book of Revelation, and last week we finished up chapter 9, and it didn't cover much last week, but this morning we're going to study chapter 10, and um, that's as far as we're going to go this morning. Next Sunday morning, uh, this is probably something I should have done when we, when we started the book of Revelation. I'm going to go back and, and do, do some, some more, a little bit more history ideas to kind of help with the... Uh, with the book of Revelation, because there's, there's two views on when it was written. And I want to spend some time uh, talking about those two different views, uh, which were about 20, 20 years apart. The views on why some think that, that, that John wrote the book uh, right before the, the, the fall of, of Jerusalem, the destruction of Jerusalem. And then you've got others that think that he wrote the book around 92 AD. And so we'll just look at some, di some different people's ideas on that. We won't spend the whole class on it, but we'll spend a few minutes talking about that. And then we'll jump into chapter 11. But uh, one of the things, uh, as I've been continuing my research uh, about these things, is that uh, what I found was that most people believe that John was born in A.D. 6. So he would have been just a little younger than, than, than Jesus. And they believe that he died in A.D. 100, which means he lived to be about 94 years old, if, if those records are, are accurate. So if the idea that John wrote the book earlier than a lot of people think, uh, the ones that think that he wrote the book earlier think that it was the Emperor Nero that exiled him to Patmos. Okay, so, and if that was the case, then... Their belief is that the book was probably written in A.D. 68 or A.D. 69 when John was about 62, 63 years old. And then the other side, the, the other side where people believe that he wrote the book in, you know, later like 95, 96 A.D., uh, if that was the case, they believe that the emperor Domitian it was the one that exiled John to Patmos. And if that's the case, then John would have been about 90 years old when he, when he wrote the book. So next week, and if you want to do some research on that so you can add to the class next week, you can, but we will talk about that. So as we've studied so far these first nine chapters, we have kind of looked at both, both of those views, the earlier writing versus the later writing, and, and what some of these scriptures may have meant one way or the other. Um, I think that probably I've leaned more towards the earlier writing in my classes, not that I know whether, whether it was earlier or later, but I've leaned that way. So we're, we're going to read the chapter 10, which is very short, and then we will, uh, we will look at each verse and, and, and do the best we can with understanding it. Uh, Revelation chapter 10, I saw another strong angel coming down out of heaven clothed with a cloud, and the rainbow was upon his head, and his face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book which was open. He placed his right foot on the sea, and his left foot on the land. And he cried out with a loud voice, as when a lion roars. And when he had cried out, the seven peals of thunder uttered their voices. When the seven peals of thunder had spoken, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying, Seal up things which the seven peals of thunder have spoken, and do not write them. Then the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land lifted up his right hand to heaven, and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things in it, and the earth and the things in it, and the sea and the things in it, that there will be no delay, excuse me, there will be delay no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, when the mystery of God is finished, as he preached to his servants, the prophets, then the voice which I heard from heaven, I heard again speaking with me and saying, Go take the book which is open in the hand of the angel, who stands on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel, telling him to give me the little book. And he said, Take to me, excuse me, he said to me, Take it and eat it. 
It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it, and in my mouth it was sweet as honey. And when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. And they said to me, You must prophesy again concerning many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. So we see a very interesting uh, part of John's vision here. And uh, again, we, we have the two different views on this chapter. The one writer who took the view that this chapter is talking about the Reformation movement, uh, where, the Bible, where the written Bible was given to, to people. Okay, so that's one view. Uh, and timing of this view would have been when the Roman Catholic Church was powerful and the priests did not allow people to have Bibles at that time. Uh, instead, they wanted people to rely on the priest to tell them what the Bible said. Uh, people like Martin Luther were considered enemies of the Catholic Church because he wanted the people to have their own Bibles. And this view may or may not be correct, we don't know, but just, just some ideas that, that come out as you're studying along uh, on this book. Uh, again, we're reading the symbolic scripture here that John wrote during his visions. And we can't, I can't imagine uh, being a human being and seeing the things that, that John has seen, being taken up into heaven in this vision. Um, so John has seen things and heard things that no other man had heard other than Christ. Christ was there. Uh, so in verse 1, it says, I saw another angel coming down out of heaven, another strong angel. He mentions the word strong. And the rainbow was up on his head, and his face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. So evidently there was something about this angel just looking at him that made John describe him as being strong, powerful, that type of view that John had of him. He's described as wearing a cloud, and the rainbow was on his head. Again, You've got to remember that John is seeing these things and he is describing what he's seeing as best he can from the human mind. Uh, so was he wearing an actual cloud? Did he have a rainbow on his head? Maybe or maybe not, but that's what John saw. That's the way John described it. And he said his face was bright like the sun and his feet were like pillars of fire. You know, it's interesting that in this description, uh, it reminds us of things in the Old Testament, as we're going to read along. You think about the cloud and the pillars of fire, kind of reminds us of how God led the Israelites out of Egypt, doesn't it? You think back, so many of the things that we're reading seem to parallel with things in the Old Testament, and that's found in Exodus chapter 14, verses 19 through 25. We see uh, this, 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 cloud, this cloud and the pillars of fire. And as God looked down through the pillar of fire and cloud, He caused the Egyptian army to be confused. And we read that in Exodus 14. And they became afraid, and they said, Let us flee from Israel, for the Lord is fighting for them against the Egyptians. One of the things that I find interest, interesting as we study the Old Testament, and uh, we study the stories of Israelites as they come out of Egypt, and as they conquer lands and different things, how that people, uh, Gentiles, uh, people of other nations, did recognize God as, as these men did. They recognized God, the God of the Israelites, and yet they did not follow God. It's really strange. Uh, so, any comments about the, 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 this idea of the, uh, the pillars of fire and the cloud? Any thoughts on that that you'd like to share before we move on? And we do have a microphone ready to go tonight, this morning. And another view on these scriptures is that uh, just as God saved the Israelites from the Egyptians, God would save the, G the Christians from the Jews and the Romans that were persecuting them at, the t at that time. Now the rainbow, I know that kind of triggers things in your mind too, the rainbow over the angel's head kind of reminds us of the rainbow that God sent to, uh, to Noah to basically promise that he would never flood the earth again. It was a sign. And we still see that rainbow today. And I hope that all of you like me, when I see a rainbow, I can't help but think about God's promise that he would not flood the earth and destroy the earth with water again. And we, we see that in Genesis chapter 9, 9 verses 13 through 17. So the rainbow serves as a symbol of hope, right? I mean, hope that, that God is going to save us from, from the floods in that case. 
And then we see the, another description of the angel where his face shines like the sun, which reminds us of the angel that was at Christ's tomb. Remember in Matthew chapter 28, it said that, um, uh, and, and the face of Jesus at the transfiguration in Matthew 17, both, both situations, we see uh, the angel's face and Jesus' face kind of shine like the sun. And we know that when we think about white and light, we think about purity, we think about righteousness, and, and I think that's the, the idea that came along with, with this. Any comments about the rainbow or the, or the face like the sun over here? Let, hang on, let him do it. So that way people can hear you that's watching at home. The other thing has to do with uh, Moses and the veil. Moses yeah. was in the presence of God, and his face shone like the sun, too, and he had to use a veil. Right. And, and, and even when he came off the mountain, mm -hmm. people were afraid of him, you know, right. but because his face shone, because he'd been in the presence of God again. Right. So, yeah, another good thought. I, I should have had that one in here on my notes as well. Any other thoughts or comments? Okay, in verse 2. We see where the angel's holding a book or a scroll. Chances are it's probably like a scroll. That's what they used at that time. In his hand and said the book was open. And not like the book in chapter 5. We go back to chapter 5. It talks about a book that was sealed there. This book was not sealed. It was open. Uh, and the scripture does not tell us why the angel had his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. But it kind of... I kind of picture this as him being so just huge, you know, uh, uh, bigger than life, uh, to, 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 to be standing the way he was standing. And, uh, and maybe that's why John described him as being strong. Maybe, maybe John saw, maybe he saw that he was, he's, he's big, and I mean, he's, he's standing on the earth, and he's just bigger than life. And so maybe that's why he called him a, a strong angel. And he says that the angel was holding this book, uh, opened up, and most of your Bibles will refer back to Ezekiel, chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, where Ezekiel saw a, a hand extending out to him with a scroll in it, and it was opened. And he saw lamentations and mourning and woe written on the pages. And so you see a lot of parallels, uh, prophecies in the Old Testament, for example, the book of Ezekiel here. Uh, and in chapter 3, Ezekiel was also told to eat the scroll. Isn't that something that we see a, same, a similar vision that Ezekiel had back in his time? And he was told to eat the scroll just like John was told to eat the scroll or the book. And he described it as being sweet like honey. And the scroll was given to Ezekiel as a message, we know, uh, from God to be delivered to the people. And so John also was given this book and told to eat it, and it was going to be a message to the people. So we see that in, in, in this Revelation chapter 2, verse 9, in a few minutes when we get, I mean, it's 10, verse 9, when we get to that. So we just see some interesting things going on. And uh, I had a good discussion with somebody after class last Sunday morning, and I appreciated that conversation with them. And uh, and, and I know that I, a lot of times I spend, I spend a lot of time in class telling you that I really don't understand a lot of things we're reading here and that, that a lot of people don't understand it. And, and it's true, but there are a lot of things that we can, can learn from, from the book, and that's what the whole point of studying it uh, on Sunday morning. Any comments before we move on to verse 3? Over here. We may get through early today, I don't know, if we do. We'll get you know, Alan, just on that point you just made about uh, understanding, um, the book is written to the churches. It's not written to an individual. Right. So it's, uh, I can see this being uh, read in a church environment, just like you're teaching now. They would be reading the, the lesson. And uh, at that time, the Old Testament scriptures were I mean, there were a few letters that were being circulated, but the Old Testament scriptures were something that everybody had. Mm -hmm. um, so there are going to be a lot of references to Old Testament, and that would mean, and somebody in the church at that time that was being talked to would say, oh, 
you know what, that's, that's somewhere in, that's in Ezekiel, or that's right. in Daniel or something, and that would right. get the message across. Yeah, and, and going back to this idea where there's two different ideas, and, and I, I'll be honest with you, I don't know which idea is correct when he wrote the book. I don't know if it was prior to the destruction of Jerusalem, and I don't know if it was in 95 A.D. I just don't know because there's so many uh, conflicting uh, arguments there, and, and, and there, there are good arguments on both sides for that. So let's just assume that, that he wrote the book prior to the destruction of Jerusalem, just for a moment. So... As you just mentioned, he wrote the book to the churches, okay? It was written to the churches. And if it was written prior to the destruction of Jerusalem, a lot of this stuff would have made sense to them, right? But even if it was written in 95 AD, uh, the, the, the persecution, the church was not over. Uh, we also know that God is, uh, through over a few hundred years, he's going to wipe out the Roman Empire because of what they did. He, he used the Roman Empire uh, uh, for his purposes, uh, which included uh, persecuting Christians. Uh, so either way, uh, I think that the, the people at that time that was reading John's writing would have understood it better than us because they could have, they could have, saw, they could have seen the things that, that really just lined up with what he was saying. And when you have writers that, uh, like, that may have been 100 years after some of these things, these things happened, write down what they think happened and when it happened and you see that they don't even agree it makes it even harder for us you know nearly 2,000 years later to uh, to understand it as well okay verse 3 as the angel cried out with a loud voice John described it as the sound of a, a lion when a lion roars so we know that it was kind of a fierce voice as he cried out and probably loud and, and maybe another reason why John described him as being strong in verse 1. Now, when he cried out, seven peals of thunder spoke. Okay, do you have somebody's hand up? Sorry, we'll stop right here. We'll stop with the seven peals for a moment. I, I just wanted to make a point about the lion as a symbol of strength. It is. It's called the king of beasts, and few can stand against it. So it's a powerful, it's, it's with much power and authority he's saying this here. Yeah, and if you think about the, the animal kingdom and... You know, lions are in Africa and different places. Uh, I don't know that lions really have a natural enemy. I, I know that there's been occasions where a lion would be messing with an elephant or something like that and get hurt or killed. But, but generally, unless, unless a lion is attacking them, uh, they really don't have any natural enemies. So again, the idea is strength there. And so that's what we see here. And now when, when this angel cries out, we, we, John hears these seven peals of thunder. Now I try to look that up, and, and peals of thumber, thunder is mentioned eight times in the book of Revelation. And basically, from what I can read, they're just, they're sounds or noises, not necessarily something you could see, but just hear. Uh, that doesn't mean you couldn't see them, but, but that kind of, is the idea that I've got these peals of thunder were something uh, that he could hear. And, uh, when you think about thunder, you think about it being kind of loud and, 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 and scary, uh, especially when you think about lightning and things like that. Uh, so this is what John is seeing. This is what he's describing. And in verse 4, John was about to write down what they were saying. Okay, they were saying something. And, but he hears a voice from heaven, possibly, probably God, which told him to seal them up and not write down what they were saying. Now I think, I think, I can't remember which chapter it was, uh, where John, in part of the vision, there were some names that were mentioned, but John was told not to disclose those names. I can't remember exactly where it was. I should have looked that up. But that's at least two times so far that we see God was not ready to reveal things that, that were happening uh, at this time during the vision. So uh, he, tells them, he tells them to seal it up, don't write it down. And um, now one Bible scholar, again, this is just a, a guy's ideas, suggested that maybe they were representing false teachers. But I don't see anything that would, would indicate that. I think he's, we've got to be careful not to, to reach out there and, and try to find things that are not there. I remember one time uh, somebody talked about 
how that uh, all these years the Bible's been there, and now all of a sudden uh, he was able to, to read between the lines of things in the Bible and things that have never been taught, never been brought up before. And sometimes I think we've got to be careful not to do that, not to, not to just assume things. So we don't know any more than that about these peals of thunder, but they, we do know that G- God or somebody told, them not to, told John not to write it down. Yes? When? Psalm 29, 3 through 9. You, you might want to read, want to you read that for us? Uh, it's just talking about the voice of God and it's comparing it to thunder. Uh-huh. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord is over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. Yes, the Lord splinters the cedars of Lebanon. He makes them also skip like a calf. Lebanon and Syrian <clears throat> like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord divides the flames of fire. The vo- voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The voice or the Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare. And in his temple, everyone says glory. That's a reference to thunder and comparing yeah. the voice of the Lord or peals of thunder. Yeah, and, and there's no doubt about it. When we hear thunder, we notice it, don't we? we? We take note of it. It's not something that we ignore. You know, birds can be tweet, uh, tweeting out there in the trees and uh, you can hear dogs bark and things like this, but when you hear thunder, it gets your attention. And that, that's, so, and that, that's what the, the, the Lord's voice is like. And I think I read this last week in Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29, where it says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our sons forever, that we may observe all the words of this law. Uh, so, so the peals of thunders could have, could have been things spoken that God just did not want to reveal at that time or maybe even e- ever, who knows. But we do know that in the Old Testament that we're told that some, some, some things are secret to the Lord and He wants to keep it that way. In verses 5 through 7, if you notice as we're getting in this chapter, there's been a, a time delay just as it was earlier. There was a time delay after the sixth trumpet was blown. So we're still waiting for the seventh trumpet to be blown by the seventh angel, and which reminds us of chapter 7 when we had uh, the seals being opened. And after the sixth seal was opened, of course Jesus is opening his seals, we, we see a, a delay before the seventh seal was opened. And if you remember, I think there was like a, like a, a silence for like 30 minutes uh, when the seventh seal was to be opened. So... Uh, One of the things that, that people sometimes get confused about in the book of Revelation is they, a lot of the things they think that's talking about uh, the end of time. And, and we know as we study that he's not talking about the end of time here when the seventh seal is going to be open, or not seal, but the seventh horn is going to be blown. Um, and the reason I know that is because we learn in the first part of the the book that these things are soon going to come to pass. Now, soon with, with the Lord can be hundreds of years. And we do think that there was a long time frame that all of these things uh, before they came to pass. But we know since we're at least, at least 1900 years later than John and still alive that, that it wasn't talking about the end of time. So now uh, we see where the seventh angel is going to blow his horn. And uh, and who knows exactly what this this seventh horn is supposed to represent? But some people believe it's the fulfillment of the prophecies we read in the Old Testament. Writers like Daniel, in Daniel chapter nine, where he was predicting the destruction of Jerusalem, and uh, even Jesus in Matthew twenty four. And his prophecies describing the abomination of desolation, in other words, the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, that, that may be what he's talking about. I don't know. Uh, any comments on, on these, these five through seven verses here? Anybody got any comments or thoughts on them? Okay. Then we jump into verses 8 through 10. And uh, John hears a voice from heaven telling him to take up the book open. Uh, the open book from the angel uh, who's standing on the land in the sea, one foot in the sea, one foot on the land. 
And John goes to the angel and asks for the book. I, I, I would just love to know what his thoughts were. He sees this strong angel that is standing partly in the ocean, partly on the, on the land. And, and he, he has a voice that, that roars like a lion. And John is told to go to this angel and, and say, give me that book. So uh, it makes you wonder, what, was he afraid? I mean, I, I think he probably was a little bit afraid. Uh, I, I think any of us would have been afraid. Just in all that he was seeing, we'd have been afraid. Uh, so uh, it's interesting that he, that, that he does. And John goes to the angel and he asks for the book. And the angel does give it to him. But the angel tells him to eat the book. I don't know what, what this means. I don't know why Ezekiel in his vision was told to eat this book. I don't know why John was told to eat the book. Maybe by eating the book, it was going to impart knowledge to him to, to be able to write these things. I don't know. Uh, I do find it interesting that the book was sweet when he was eating it in his mouth, sweet like honey. Uh, but when he swallowed it, it made him sick in his stomach. And uh, we've heard those saying bittersweet. You know, sometimes things happen that are bittersweet. I, I don't really know what that means. Does anybody have any thoughts or ideas of what the idea was here about the, the book tasting sweet and then making him sick in his stomach. Okay. He's coming. How many times if you needed to tell somebody something that was a good thing to tell them, but it put a, you know, a, a lump in your gut, yeah. gave you, oh, I've got to tell you this, it's, it's something you need to know, but the nerves you know, yeah. put butterflies in your stomach. I think that's what it is. Yeah, uh, and, and you know, have you ever had anybody tell you, so you got some things to tell you. Maybe you're building a house, contractors. I got, I got some things to tell you. You want to hear the good or the bad first? You know? <laughs> and and uh, so I don't know, uh, uh, I don't know which, I think I'd want to hear the bad first, you know. That's just me personally, but not everybody's that way. You got your hand up. Well, if you think about it historically, you know, they're, they're looking forward to the fall of the Roman Empire because they're persecuting them. But at the same time, the fall of the Roman Empire was the fall of civilization to a large degree that after that was several hundred years of the Dark Ages where people were living in terrible poverty and plague and famine and just really hard times to live through. So it would be great that the Lord has triumphed. Yeah. But it would yeah. also be a very difficult time to live through. Yeah, that's a good point. It kind of reminds me of uh, Ukraine, what Ukraine's going through right now. I mean, that country has just been just destroyed. The infrastructure, the buildings, and things like that. And and you can imagine that if if the Russians finally stop and they they, they back out, uh, the 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 Ukrainians will be happy for the fact that they're gone. The war is over. But look at the pain and suffering that they're going to deal deal with, just like just like the the Christians did uh, when the Roman Empire was eventually wiped out. Uh, even though God was watching over them, uh, they still suffered. And, uh, and, and I know that, I, and I don't remember where it was, but we've already studied it, but there was a point where Jesus says that these things that are going to happen uh, will never happen again. In other words, the, the, the bad things that were going to happen would never be this bad again. And we're thankful for that. Any other comments? Bittersweet. Okay, move on to verse 11. So finally, the angel told John to prophesy again about many people, nations, tongues, and kings, which, again, rem makes me think that when he ate the book, the book gave him knowledge to, to prophesy these things that he's, that he's supposed to prophesy. So the, the scene of John eating the book, uh, he gained this knowledge from the book, and kind of like Ezekiel probably did when he ate the book in his vision, um, we know that there were going to be good things happen for Christians, as, as uh, David just mentioned, but there are also going to be some bad things happen uh, because of the persecution and things that, uh, that were going to happen and those people that rejected Christ. Uh, and we know, and we mentioned last week, that not only were the Romans uh, persecuting Christians, uh, the Jews were too. Uh, the Jews persecuted Christians from the very beginning, right? Uh, when the, after the church was established, uh, uh, the Jews, uh, they went after them. Uh, Paul, being a Jew before he became a Christian, uh, went after Christians, persecuted Christians, and uh, even participated in the death of Christians like Stephen. 
Um, moving on, any comments about verse 11? Then we jump into verse 12. The fourth angel. Do what? Am I? Am I? Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, yeah. These are old notes here. Good grief. Yeah. We just. We just. Where did? Where did it happen? Where did I go here? I think I've lost uh, some of my paperwork. <laughs> hmm. Hang on. Let me find myself here. I shouldn't have brought all this old stuff with me. Okay. I think we're finished. <laughs> I think we're finished here. And I can't even find the sheet that I had just a moment ago. <laughs> That's pretty bad. There it is. There it is. Okay. Any other comments about this chapter? We've got 15 minutes left. Yes, sir. Testament and the times that, that man has been in, in the vicinity of God, you know, the hand writing on the wall uh, in the book of Daniel, mm -hmm. uh, just the awesomeness of God. Uh, and then I was looking up um, Matthew chapter 17, you know, it says that, that the voice were like peals of thunder and they were uttered. Uttered makes me think of whispered. Not not at a loud voice, just an, it's just so there, uh -huh. you know, like a clap of thunder. Um, it, it reminded me of uh, the Mount of Transfiguration, and when Peter's made a suggestion that, that three tabernacles be made for Jesus, Moses, and Elijah, and it says, while he was still speaking, this is Peter, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear him. And there's an explanation mark there. Yeah. Which makes me think that it was a little louder than normal. Yeah. And the response was, and when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly af afraid. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and do not be afraid. Yeah. So just the awesomeness of being in the presence of God. Yeah. And I you th think I th about that today yeah. with movies and television and the... Um, the instance, uh, so many times you hear the Lord's name taken in vain, you know, and they don't know what they're doing. I know, I know. We, we need to really be careful about that. Uh, we watch a lot of these, uh, these shows where they remodel houses and things, and, and the people, the people uh, will walk into the house, and the first thing they say over and over again is OMG, OMG. And they just don't understand that, that they are abusing God's name. And uh, I hope that all of us will remember that. I've even heard members of the church that have done the same thing. We just need to be careful. Since we've got a few minutes, though, I, let's just look at chapter 11 to, to prepare, prepare for next week because I think it's interesting because, again, we're going to be uh, going back to and talking about Ezekiel. So let's look at the first couple of verses here. Uh, it says, Then there was given me a measuring rod, a staff, and someone said, Get up and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship in it. I think it's interesting that several times someone talks to, to John in his vision and he does not identify who they were. In this case, he just says, someone, someone said to me to get up and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship in it. If you go back and study this week back in Ezekiel chapter 40, verse 3, through, all the way through 42, verse 20, we see where Ezekiel has a similar thing happen to him. He's told to do some measuring. And, and here, verse 2, it says, Leave out the court which is outside the temple and do not measure it, for it has been given to the nations, and they will tread underfoot the holy city for 42 months. And verse 3 says, And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. So go back and do a little study in Ezekiel. And, and Now, it gets into details how he's supposed to measure and all these different things, and we'll talk about that next week. So I'm going to close the class right now unless someone else has something else to say and give you all a few minutes to talk. Anybody have anything else? Let's bow and have a prayer. 
Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for another beautiful day, and we're thankful for the time that we've had to spend together this morning studying from Revelation. Father, we're thankful for your word, and we're thankful, Father, that it's written in such a way that we can study it every day of our life and still continue to learn things. And we pray, Father, that you will help us to learn as we continue this study in the book of Revelation. Father, we're thankful for uh, the church. We're thankful for the blessings that we have through the church, Father, as we, we look around and see all each other, as we love each other and care for each other. And, and Father, when some of us have hard times, we're, the others are there for, the, for us, Father, and we're just thankful for that. And Father, as we're studying and thinking about your name, we pray, Father, that we'll always show you the honor and the reverence that you truly deserve and that we'll never misuse your name or your word, Father. We realize how serious it is to be a Christian, to be a follower of yours, and that we pray that we'll always take it serious. Father, we're mindful of those that are sick, and we pray that you will heal them if it be your will. And we have so many, Father, on our, our prayer list and our extended prayer list that are suffering at this time, and some of them very serious. And we just pray that if it be your will, that you'll restore their health. And Father, more importantly than that, we pray that you will be with their their spirit, we pray that you will help them to make things right with you if there's, there's problems, Father. We pray that you will be with those who have not obeyed the gospel, and we pray, Father, that you will touch their hearts, and they'll do so before it's everlasting too late. Father, we love you, and we're thankful for your son, Jesus, and we pray, Father, that in all the things we do in our life, that we will honor you and, and show you the respect so that the world may know that we're your children. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thank you. Sorry, I was a little short on my class this morning. You never know sometimes how long a, a lesson's going to last. On that resurrection morning, when the trump of God shall sound, we shall rise, we shall rise. All the saints shall come rejoicing, and no tears will ever be found. We shall rise, we shall rise. We shall rise, hallelujah. We shall rise, amen. We shall rise. Rise on that resurrection morning when this prison bars are broken. We shall rise, we shall rise. On that resurrection morning, blessed thought it is to be. We shall rise, we shall rise. I shall see my blessed Savior who so freely died for me. We shall rise, we shall rise. We shall rise, hallelujah. We shall rise, amen. We shall rise. Rise on that resurrection morning when this prison bars are broken. We shall rise, we shall rise. On that resurrection morning we shall meet him in the air. We shall rise, we shall rise. And be carried up to glory to our homes of bright and fair. We shall rise, we shall rise. We shall rise, hallelujah. We shall rise, amen. We shall rise. Rise on that resurrection morning when this prison bars are broken. We shall rise, we shall rise. We shall rise, hallelujah. We shall rise, amen. We shall rise on that resurrection morning when this prison bars are broken. We shall rise, we shall rise. We shall rise, hallelujah. We shall rise, amen. We shall rise. Resurrection morning when this prison bars are broken. We shall rise, we shall rise, we shall rise, we shall rise. One thing we ask of you, one thing that we desire, that as we worship you, Lord, come and change our lives. Arise. Sing, arise, 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 arise. One thing we ask of you, one thing that we desire, that as we worship you, Lord, come and change our lives. 
Arise, 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 take your place, be enthroned on our praise, arise, King of kings, holy God, as we sing, arise, arise, arise. change our lives Jesus arise Lord change our lives Jesus arise Lord change our lives Jesus arise Lord change our lives Jesus arise 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 kings holy god as we sing arise 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 there is a redeemer jesus god's own Precious Lamb of God, Messiah, Holy One. Thank you, O my Father, for giving us your Son and leaving your Spirit till the work on earth is done. Jesus, my Redeemer, name above all names, precious Lamb of God, Messiah, oh, for sin is slain. Thank you, O my Father, for giving us your Son. And leaving your spirit till the work on earth is done. When I stand in glory, I will see his face. There I'll serve my King forever in that holy place. Thank you, O oh my Father, for giving us your Son and leaving your Spirit till the work on earth is done. And leaving your Spirit till the work on earth is done. still and know you are God. Find rest my soul in Christ alone. Know his power in quietness and trust. When the oceans rise and thunders roar, 
I will soar with you above the storm. Father, you are king over the flood. I will be still and know you are God. When the oceans rise and thunders roar, I will soar with you above the storm. Father, you are king over the flood. I will be still and know you are God. I will be still and know you are God. Father, I see that you were drawing lying in the sand, and I want to be standing on your side, holding your hand. So let your kingdom come, let it live in me. This is my prayer, this is my plea. Father, I see that you were drawing Lying in the sand And I want to be standing on your side Holding your hand So let your kingdom come Let it live in me This is my prayer This is my plea Let the worshipers arise Let the sons and the daughters sing 
surrendering my all. I surrender to the King. Let the worshippers arise. Let the sons and the daughters sing. I surrender in my all. I surrender to the King. Father, I hear it growing louder, the song of your redeemed. As the saints of every nation are awakening to sing, from our hearts there comes an anthem. Oh, hear the heavens ring. This is our song, a song to our King. Let the worshippers arise. Let the sons and the daughters sing. I surrender in my all. I surrender to the King. Let the worshippers arise. Let the sons and the daughters sing. I surrender in my all. I surrender to the King. I surrender in my all. I surrender to the King. Jesus, wash my sins away one glorious morning. He blessed my soul. He blessed my soul. And he made me whole. whole. Ever since that happy day, I'm telling the story. How we wash my sins away when he blessed my soul. Oh, oh, oh. You ought 
ought have been there that blessed morning when the love of the Lord came down into my soul, into my soul, and, and He made me whole. If you'd have been there, you'd have shouted glory to the Lamb, to my Lord and King. And you ought have been there. Yes, you ought have been there when He blessed my soul. Jesus claimed me as His own one glorious morning. He blessed my soul, he blessed my soul, and he made me whole. Ever since this joy I've known, I'm telling the story. How he washed my sins away when he blessed my soul. Well, you ought to been there that blessed morning when the love of the Lord came down into my soul, into my soul and he made me whole. You ought to been there when he blessed my soul. Well, you ought to been there that blessed morning when the love of the Lord came down into my soul, into my soul and, and he made me whole. If you'd have been there, you shouted glory to the Lamb, to my Lord and King. And you ought to been there. Yes, you ought to been there when he blessed my soul. my soul you ought have been there when he blessed my soul I'm in the way the bright and shining way I'm in the glory land glory land way telling the world that Jesus saves today yes I'm in If ever 
merciful Savior, precious Redeemer and friend. Who would have thought that a lamb could rescue the souls of men? Oh, he rescued the souls of men. Counselor, comforter, keeper, spirit we long to embrace. You offer hope when our hearts have hopelessly lost the way. Oh, we've hopelessly lost the way. You are the one that we praise. You are the one we adore. You give the healing and grace our hearts always hunger for. Oh, our hearts always hunger for. Almighty, infinite Father, faithfully loving your own. Here in our weakness you find us falling before your throne. Oh, we're falling before your throne. You are the one that we praise. You are the one we adore. You give the healing and grace our hearts always hunger for. Oh, our hearts always hunger Satisfied with just a cottage below, by a little silver and a little gold. But in that city where the ransom will shine, I want a gold one, that silver line. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop. You pray with me, please. Our merciful and all-wise Father in heaven, we're so grateful to you for the many great blessings that you bestowed upon us at this good time. The beautiful Sunday morning that we have, the privilege that we have to come to assemble together and worship you and study from your word. Father, we're mindful of all that are sick, many that are on our prayer list, as well and we pray lord that they may soon recover from their sickness it's so great to see kevin walk in this morning it's so great to see brother craig and all others that the issues that they have fighting with in life and we pray that their lives will be healed and that they will live for you Lord, we're grateful to you for the things that we have in this life and the things that are well with us. And we're so grateful for this privilege that we have to worship you this morning. Be with Brother Greg as he brings us a great lesson. Be with our song leaders and all others. And Lord, we pray that Ultimately, we have lived a life pleasing unto you that one day we can be with you eternally. For these and all blessings we ask in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Good morning. It's good to be back this morning. Uh, just a couple of announcements from myself before we uh, get started this morning. Uh, number one, we, uh, Allie and I just wanted to extend uh, a thank you to everyone who was involved in our wedding. Uh, we know that there were many people who worked very, very hard on that, so we want to give a very warm thank you to everyone who uh, participated in that and uh, attended and was a part of that. Um, also, secondly, this morning, um, Gavin and I have decided to uh, start a song leading class. Uh, we are going to be doing that on Sunday afternoons uh, at 4.30. Um, we're going to be starting that next week. Um, Gavin and I feel it's very important to uh, share the song leading experience and knowledge that we have. And this goes for anyone who is young enough to start song leading, to 
any age above who would like to learn more about song leading um, and maybe sharpen their skills. Or if you've never led a song before, we'd encourage you to do that too. We'd love to have as many capable men here as possible. So there is a sign-up sheet in the foyer. Um, this is such a very important thing. It's so important, in fact, that Gavin won't be here next week. Um, <laughs> but we will be doing this um, till about early August. Um, it'll be sort of one-on-one -on -one teaching, uh, so we really only have room for one person per person uh, each Sunday afternoon. So we'll be doing that starting next week at 4.30 on Sunday afternoons here at the building. So if you want to do that, uh, be sure to sign up on the sheet out in the foyer. Uh, we're going to start off this morning with God will take care of you. Verses 1 and 4. God will take care of you. Verses 1 and 4. There it goes. <laughs> Be not dismayed, whatever he time, God will take care of you. Even in the streets of love of life, God will take care of you. God will take care of you through every day.
Scripture reading this morning comes from Matthew 5, 13, verses 13 and 14. In your pew Bibles, that will be on page 960. You are the salt of the earth, but the salt has become tasteless. How can it be salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled upon by the foot of man. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Let us bow. <clears throat> Almighty God, we bow humbly before you this morning, expressing our need for you to help us as we walk through life, that we have a, 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 want to express a dependence on you as our creator, as a giver of life and a source of every blessing that we have. We want to most of all thank you for Jesus Christ that you loved us so much and you are love. You gave your only son that he come to this earth and fulfilled his mission. He died and was buried and rose again on that third day. We're thankful, Father, for the congregation here. We're thankful for each one that's here today that we come here to worship, honor, and glorify your name, to sing these songs of praise, and to uh, come before you in prayer and petitions. And we ask you, Father, be Brother Greg, as he brings a lesson this morning. We're thankful that he is recovering from his uh, knee surgery, and we, we're thankful that for the advances Kevin has made and myself, and we pray that we continue to be strengthened as we go forward day by day. We're thankful, Father, for our elders here at the congregation at Stewart's Creek. Pray for Brother Allen, Brother Rick, and Brother Bobby. We want to let them know that they have our back, that we are supporting them, and we're thankful for their decisions they make as they try to lead us day by day. Father, we want to uh, be reminded of our adversary that we face each day that he is the author of anything that's evil and he has a lot of power and strength and we need to understand his craftiness and what he does to try to lead us in the wrong paths away from you. His sole purpose is to separate us from eternal God. We ask this morning that you forgive us of our sins. We pray that we can be cleansed and be acceptable in your sight this time. We want to think about uh, our society we live in that seems to be one that's pushing God further and further away. We want to continue to lift up a voice for the unborn, and we're thankful that uh, the high court of the land now is considering taking a different stance on this and standing up for the pro-life uh, for all of our unborn that uh, you give life to. We thank you, Lord, for the uh, blessings that you give us this last week, and we know that we move time to time, place to place, that we ask for safety and, and watch over us. We want to learn to love each other better and help us learn to esteem others above ourselves. We just want to continue on now through this week, and we pray for our opportunities we have to speak a word of Jesus to others and help us to remember that the word of God is the final answer. It is the complete and total truth that we want to push aside any of our opinions and accept this word. We pray now that you could turn on with us through this day. We do honor, praise, and worship your name today. Only through your name that we live and move and have our being we ask it in most, the, the biggest blessing of all, in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. It's good to see everyone out this morning. We appreciate you being here with us. Uh, we do have a lot of visitors, but we also have a lot of regulars that are out. Uh, the season of travel and vacations have begun. So let's keep all them that are traveling in our prayers. Uh, and on our minds so that they all return back safely. Of course, we've got our uh, camp coming up soon, uh, VBS as well, not too far off the future, so keep all that in your prayers. Uh, one quick announcement before I begin is uh, right after service this morning, 
Uh, Clay Hill's got a option or opportunity for a men's day out. Uh, so if you could meet with him just quickly in the fellowship hall, let him share you, with you what that is so that he can get a, a number of those interested to see if it's worth uh, his time to, to get it all organized. He's already looks like he's got a bunch of it organized as it is. Uh, but he needs to know if there's enough of you interested to continue on. So if you can meet just real quick, it won't take him long to show you what he has, and you would either raise your hand or, or not on uh, that, and then he can get the sign-up sheet accordingly. But, yeah, just right after service. I started a college class. Uh, our, our college group has grown, and now that they're home for summer, I wanted to be able to offer that as an op- option. And so the first class we had last week, I gave them index cards, and I said, I, I want to know what you want to learn about. And you know, I was hoping that each one would put at least a couple of things on the card. No, I got like five or six on each card. Uh, and the topics were, were impressive, I'll say. The things that they're wanting to learn more about. A lot of it is just how to deal with the world and people in the world as a Christian. And uh, so you're going to get some sermons off of these topics. They're that good. And as I'm trying to do study on some of them to be better prepared to to teach the classes. And I've got Rick and Caleb also helping. We're kind of in a a rotation on Sundays and and Wednesdays. Uh, The young men in it are volunteering to teach classes, which I'm very excited about. Uh, So uh, I'm really positive about it all, but I think it's going to help me as a Christian as much as them studying the topics that they're interested in. This topic this morning actually comes from part of the concept of of some of the questions they had about Christians and how to live in the world, influence the world as Christians. Because they're being faced today with all sorts of questions from everything from from the LGBTQ to, to racism to atheism to evolution. I mean, it's so broad of a spectrum that they're having to deal with and they're being asked as Christians questions about and they're wanting answers. And amen to them for wanting the answers and and wanting to look for those answers. And we as Christians need to be providing those answers. I think one of our biggest weaknesses we have in a pulpit today is we are not facing today's problems with God's answers. We're too stuck on the same old, same old, and let's say everybody be happy, but there's some tough things out there. We as Christians, the answers are here, but we need to be looking for them and sharing. So this morning, I want to talk to you about how can a Christian influence the world? Uh, This morning in in our class, we were talking about respect. How can you show respect to others and yet respect Christianity and yourself and and help others to respect your beliefs? That's deep. Um... So many things to look at in in that question. Because in the world today, whether it's at school, at work, just in general, we're tempted by the world every day. And we as Christians have to start being a bigger influence. Uh, We talked about in the class, I flicked on the news this morning for a short while. I'm, I'm getting a bad attitude towards news because it's all negative. There's people protesting about racism. There's, there's people protesting about pride. There's people protesting about abortion. There's people protesting about guns. Everybody's angry at everybody. Even Jenny was trying to sell loofahs on Marketplace. And this just tells you the attitude of, of our society today. One lady says, well, what kind of soil was it grown in? Well, my first sarcastic thought was Dirt. But Jenny says, no, I put them in miracle Grow." She sent back, well, then I just throw it all out. So she, she got on her Facebook, and she's anti pretty much everything but oxygen. And I was like, that's kind of the attitude of our society today. We, we have our attitude, and if you don't agree with it, you're wrong, and we're going to insult you. Brothers and sisters, we cannot fall into that trap. The world is so divided. And you want to say believers with unbelievers, but... I'm classifying a lot of people that are sitting on pews today as unbelievers because they go sit on the pew and they say they're Christian or whatever fill-in-the-blank religion. But they'll walk out that door and there's nothing about them that is Christian or godly. So when I'm saying believers and unbelievers, I'm not just saying people sitting in church versus people not. There's some people out there living better lives that never darken the door of a church than there are some that are living in the church. We need to keep that in mind. Believers, things that we should realize is 
there is a spiritual helplessness. You say, well, I don't like the concept of being helpless, Greg. We're helpless with lots of things. Trust me, in the past two years, I've learned I'm helpless a lot of the time because of the surgeries and the things. It seems like I just stay helpless. But we are. There's things we need help with. Well, brothers and sisters, spiritually, we need God. We can't be spiritual without Him. There should be sorrow over sin, not celebration. And yet today in our society, far too often, we are celebrating sin and things that God is against. There should be a hunger for righteousness. People have lost the desire for things to be right and for people to do what is right. I'm hearing even those in, in, in like district attorney positions, well, you know, I hate to, to arrest too many that are, are, uh, are poor or too many that are in, and they list these categories. And I'm like, wait a minute. So you're saying these people don't have to obey the laws, but these do. That's not the way it works with God, and yet too often that's what Christians want. As long as I love God attitude, it doesn't matter how I live my life, and that's wrong. There, need, there is a need for meekness and purity. Oh, does our society need both of the above? The desire to be peacemakers. Maybe we need to all go out there with signs and say, start protesting for peace in our country. I, I see people protesting and wearing things for the Ukraine. They're wanting peace there. But brothers and sisters, we need peace in our own country. And the reason we have so little peace is because God is being pushed out. Their willingness to be slandered. Brothers and sisters, this was hard when I was young. I'm learning, though, that people are going to say bad things about me because I am a Christian. They're going to insult me. They're going to make fun of me. Even in the class today, the students, the college students were talking about situations in their own lives where, you know, people see that they're reading the Bible or something that's Christian in nature and, and behind their backs where they can hear them, well, they're just stupid or they're just wrong. It's a shame, but we can't let that stop us from continuing to read the Bible publicly, to be seen saying prayers in, in restaurants. We cannot be ashamed. They're pronounced persecution. You know, when I think of persecution, I so often go back and look at what was going on during Bible times. I, as a historian, I look at, at things and where groups of people and even Christians were persecuted and how bad it was. And we're not facing those. We are very blessed. But we are being persecuted. Just the example that I talked about, people that mock you and make fun of you publicly if you show your Christianity at work, at school. Uh, every year, I keep a Bible on my bookshelf right behind my desk. And every year, there's that student, at least one, if not multiples, that see it and say, oh, you can't have that. And I always say, well, why not? That's the Bible. <laughs> yes, it is. And they say, well, you can't have a Bible in school. No, you, you can have a Bible in school. You can? Yes. And you know what? I even read it sometimes during my lunch and on my planning, and it's Okay. And they're like shocked because society has taught them that's a no-no, it's bad. You can't do that. Guess what, students? You can. You can have one in your backpack. You can take it out when you're in, in study hall and you've finished your homework. And if anybody tries to stop you, come let Mr. Greg know. I'll go talk to your principal for you. We have rights. And we as Christians need to start standing up for those rights, even if we're being persecuted and ridiculed. The unbeliever, though, they're proud, they're self-sufficient, self-centered, self-reliant, selfish. It's all about me, myself, and I. So many times you listen on the news and you hear people, and I want to start counting how many times they say, I and me and my, because that's all that matters to them. They're not looking at how it affects other people or how it may affect other lives. It's just, this is what I want. Well, you know what I want? I want everybody to be good, godly people. I'm not getting what I want. But maybe I can touch those around me and start helping someone reach those goals. Sadly, they think to see there's no other way but that they could stand as someone that is unrighteous before such a loving God. I've heard people say, you know, 
You know, I, I know I'm, I, I can't, I'm not going to face God on Judgment Day. I'm just going to go straight to, to hell. And there's nothing more heartbreaking to hear somebody, and I've heard 12-year-olds tell me that. I already know, Mr. Vic. I, I'm like, no, you, no. God's letting you live so that that can be changed. That you have an opportunity. Every day that God gives us breath is another opportunity to be a better person, to get closer to God. But so often in our world today, we have children and adults who believe they're already lost and there's nothing they can do about it. We have to be the difference to let them see. We have to be an influencer. A Christian must be an influencer by what he or she is, not what we have. Far too often, we're already, the second somebody says something, we're going to start cramming Bible verses down their throat. Before they're going to listen to our Bible verses, people, they've got to see us as a Christian. No one goes to a light they can't see. If we're shining the light, though, those that have questions will come to you. I've, I've known both of my son's experiences through their schooling where they just treated somebody nice. They weren't the best of a person. They just treated them nice. And slowly they began to see the change in that person's attitude, gaining respect from that person. I've been on jobs, I've heard many of you talk about jobs where people that are very foul-mouthed and tell nasty things, jokes, but when you're around, they're like, oh, hush, so-and-so's here. We can't tell that stuff when they're here. And you say, well, that's not, they're not changing their life. Oh, but you've already made an impact that there's a different way. We as Christians have to be that different way. Christ did not say that you have salt and that you have light. He said you are the salt and you are the light. Look at Matthew 5, 13 and 14. For you are the salt of the earth. For if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and be trodden on the foot of men. Goes on in verse 14 and says... You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. I believe it was, uh, Brother Gene, I believe it was you that, that did the, the lower lights the other night. I love that. I've heard that story before. and It's a great story. And, and there's, a, I know, a situation back, I believe it was uh, early 1920s, where a, a ship was wrecked and they sent out the Coast Guard to get it. And it was probably too dangerous to even go out. The only hope they had of getting the sailors on the ship and back safely were not just there was a lighthouse there, but they had everybody in the town turn on all their lights so that they could find the shore. During the storm, though, they lost all power. All there was was the lighthouse, and the storm was so bad you could only see it in spurts. They had everyone that was willing line up their cars along the seashore with their headlights burning and it got them home. What had they not been willing? You know, I don't want to get out in the storm in my car. It's, it, it's dangerous. I don't want to do that. It's not convenient. I just washed my car. No. Most of that town went out with their cars. There were those that, you know, they, no, I'm not going to do that. Those that were not willing to shine their lights for someone else's salvation. They weren't willing to risk the storm for someone else's salvation. But most did. Can you imagine if we as Christians, if most Christians would be willing to go out into the storm and just turn our light on? Just turn our light on. Let people see it. And it may take a while. It took them a lot longer. The people thought they were lost to get back to the shore. And that by the almost by the time they were about to give up, they saw the ship coming in, the boat coming in. They didn't give up. They kept shining that light in the worst of conditions. And brothers and sisters, in my lifetime, our country is in the worst condition it's been in. In my life. Now, I know some of you have been through World War II and Korea and Vietnam, and there were some bad situations. But in my life, we're in as bad as I've seen. We've got to start the cars and turn on the lights. And we've got to do it together. Continuing on. The believer's very presence in the world should be the salt and the light God wants it to be. 
We are the ones who show the prevention of corruption. We are the ones who are supposed to expose error. We are supposed to be the ones who are putting in the principles of the life of Christ before the world to see. We are the ones who are supposed to act the way God wants us to act. Oh, sorry, hit it too soon. We are supposed to. Notice I keep putting that in front of us. We are supposed to. That's not what I put there. But as I kept thinking about the lesson, there's too many Christians that aren't becoming the examples of Christians in action. And that's the reason we are as we are in our country. And I'll even be even more bold. A lot of it's coming from the preachers and the elders and deacons that are leading our church. They're not acting as a light or the salt. And that's why our churches are weak and afraid. We've got to change our attitudes because here's how it works. Second Peter 1, 4, it says, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. We are given precious promises. I'm a sentimental guy. It really, my family, we just all are. My mom has given me stuff that that was from her parents and, and great, my great-grandparents. and Jenny has things from her parents and, and grandparents and great-grandparents. And to those, that they're, they're priceless. Matthew had found some old cufflinks of Bob Bowles, which I can't imagine Bob wearing a tuxedo or cufflinks anyway. But he had them, and he had them, got them cleaned up, and he, he's, we took it, and it's like, are those diamonds? And she was using them. Nope, those aren't diamonds. But I guarantee you, if somebody offered him 25 or 50 bucks for it, he wouldn't take them because they got a lot more value than that to him. That should be the way we feel about God's Word. It should be precious something we're not hiding in a box, but that we want to share, that we want to use, that we want to to let people see and be a part of, and not be ashamed of who we are, whether it be our family and our history or whether it be the church and Christ. We can't shine a light if we're ashamed of our own light. Also, look in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10. Because of Christ, nonbelievers are no longer fornicators or adulterers or idolaters, Infeminate or no abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor extortioners. It is because believers taught them a different way that their lives were changed. One of the questions that was asked is, you know, how do we talk to people who have different social and attitudes, whether it be with homosexuality or, or abortion, or that's different from Christians? Because you've seen it can get pretty violent. People can get very angry. But we can teach with love and through example. And when they ask, don't be afraid to share. Don't, well, it it doesn't matter to me. No, well, this is what I believe and this is why. And if they get angry, it's okay, don't get angry back. Just say, I respect your point of view, but this is what I believe the Bible says. Let them see that you are different. They may be angry. They may hate you. But there may be a day that they're the, you're the very one they'll come and ask the big question to because you did stand. Continuing on. In 1 Corinthians 6, 11, and 12. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of God. It goes on and continues and says, All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. We need to learn how to control our lives in the sense of never putting ourselves in a position that we can't control it. What do you mean by that, Greg? Well, you may be friends with someone who is alcoholic and they get drunk every weekend. Well, Greg, you should never be friends with that person. I can't convert them if I'm not a friend to them. But I don't need to put myself in a position where I'm in the middle of all of it and they're trying to force me to become a drunk myself. I had someone once say, and I loved this, people who are under the influence are great listeners. They want to listen to you. Maybe that's the perfect time to talk to them if that's the only chance you get. 
but you don't put yourself in the middle, in the midst of the sin. It's the sinner Christ always went for. He never put himself with the sin itself. We as Christians are the power to help others come to Christ. We're not the power to save. That's God. It's His Word. It's the blood of Jesus. But we can be that light that God uses to shine to the right time for the right person. And we never know when that person is going to be or when we close a door because we didn't shine our light. We must make tough decisions as to who and what we are in Christ Jesus. Who are we? Who are we going to be? What kind of person do I want to be as a God-fearing Christian? And find my weaknesses. We all have them. Come on. I told you about the people that start yelling at you. I struggle with that, my anger. I want to start yelling back. And so I, I have to really maintain and I told him in the class, I also have learned in my old age, you learn a lot when you get old. It's a shame you don't have this wisdom when you're 20. Probably save you a lot of heartache. I guess you get the wisdom because you made all the mistakes when you were younger. But I know now kind of where my switch is. And once I start feeling me getting that to, that's when I say, well, you know, I respect your feelings. And maybe we can talk about this again. But I, I don't think we're getting anywhere with this conversation. I think we need to stop talking right now. Because then if they keep pushing, then I get angry and guess what? I turn my light off. Because I'm here, I'm here to tell you, when you get angry, you never say the right words. We have to know what our strengths and weaknesses are so we can help be the guide to other people. We must become a peculiar people. Actually, that's a popular concept right now. The shirts of why be normal? Let's be different. Well, God's been telling us that for years. 2,000 years, Jesus has been trying to teach, be different. Don't be normal, because the normal is the broad gate that everybody's following, and it's going the wrong way. Titus 2.14, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Zealous means not only do we know we're supposed to be doing it, but we're looking for the opportunity to shine the light. Where can I shine it? Oh, there's an open door. Let me go see if I can get in it. Oh, they're back there talking about how dumb it is to be a Christian. Let me go ask them, why do you feel that way? Don't come swinging a Bible at them. Why do you feel that way? Help me understand your feelings because you see through that, they might start understanding yours. And there's a door. But we cannot be ashamed the unbeliever notices how much we've changed when we do change our lives and become Christians. I've talked to people who have come out of the world and, and, and they start seeing the things that they were doing and realizing, you know, when I was in that life, I didn't realize I shouldn't be doing that. I didn't realize that was a poor decision. But now that I'm around Christian people and I'm studying God's Word, I realize, you know, that's what was causing me a lot of heartache was because I was making these poor decisions. We've got to help people change their priorities by changing our own. In Luke chapter 9, 25 and 26, it says, For what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and loses himself to be a castaway? For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed, when he shall come in his own glory and his fathers and the holy angels. If we're going to be ashamed of Christ and unwilling to shine our lights, brothers and sisters, do not expect him on judgment today to acknowledge us as his own. He, he can't. He's given us a job to be the light and the salt of the earth. So those that want to say, well, no, you, you don't have to do anything. Well, being a light is doing something. Being the salt is doing something. It affects change in the environment around you. Shine a light in darkness, see how it changes. Put salt on meat, see how it preserves. Put salt on any of your dish, see how it changes it. Those two things affect the environment around it. And guess what, Christians? That's our job, to affect the environment around us. Make the changes. We also need to learn to find contentment 
2 Corinthians 6.10 is sorrowful yet always rejoicing, is poor yet making many rich, is having nothing and yet possessing all things. I've been blessed to go, and, and many of you have gone to Honduras with me. Some have gone to Africa with Alan. Uh, they even had taken a few people to Russia back in the 90s when I went. And I watched people who had nothing be happier than most of the Americans I see today. I mean, I, I went into homes where they're sweeping their dirt floor. They're sleeping on a pad that, that's on the floor. And yet they're so happy because they have the church and they have this relationship and this friendship and, and they don't have to anymore worry about the fact, yeah, I'm poor, but my church members make sure I always have food. And, and, and they've bought my children in, in Honduras and, and places like that. If you don't have a uniform, you can't go to school. The problem is most of them cannot afford a uniform for their children, so their children go uneducated. But the churches over there, they're making sure the kids have uniforms and they have the papers and the pencils and they're making sure their children are able to go to school, something they never had before until they had God in their life. And so they have less than we do and yet they seem happier than many of us are. And you won't be humbled. Go watch that. It reminds you just how small we really are in this great big world. We need to show the world how happy we can be even if we're not the richest, not the most powerful. We don't have more letters after our name than we have in it. We can be happy because God has blessed us. This past Wednesday night, I was blessed to baptize Grace. And every time I baptize someone, I always get first hug. And I always tell them, you're my sister or you're my brother now. You're my family. And I don't mean, I'm not saying it just because there's the words I'm supposed to say. I, I, that's how I feel. And I look at these, these young men and ladies that are down here, and I've watched them all grow up from babies, and I've seen them after they become Christians. And those are my brothers and sisters. Well, maybe I'm old enough, maybe I should just call them my kids. But we're family. I was talking to Tina. We got people from Colorado. We don't hold it against Melissa. It's okay. We, we got people from California. We've never held that against Dole. It's okay. We even have a Florida State fan. We still love him. We're all different from different walks of life and different places. But we have one bond, the one that matters. We're Christian family. I've got to speed up. Contrary to what some believe, a lot of Christians' philosophy is, well, I, I'm going to avoid the sin and stay away from the sin, and to do that, I've just got to stay away from the sinner. I'm going to ignore them. Is that what Jesus did? He did not ignore sinners. He went to them. He looked for them so that he had somebody that he could touch. And you can look at 2 Corinthians 5, 4 through 7. Write that one down because I'm out of time. We're going to keep moving on. But we must interact we walk by faith, not by sight. It's real easy to talk the talk, but can we walk the walk? That's a lot more difficult, especially in my case. Matthew 5, 16 says, you are the, the light. So let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Too many times I've heard stories of people that they're at work or school and it may take years of working in that place with that person that hated them, that couldn't stand the fact they were Christians. And before long, they're asking them questions about church or the Bible. Matthew came to me a year or two ago and said, hey, we started talking about the Bible. I'd like to get Bibles for, for the guys. So we, we bought Bibles and all the guys he works with now has a Bible. And so when they have questions, they'll say, well, let's go look. It doesn't mean he's going to convert them in, in 12 hours. It may take months. It may take years. Some may never be converted. But that shouldn't mean we shouldn't plant the seed. Because you just don't know what God will do with it. To close, I'll give you an example. of a, One of my best friends through middle school and early high school, I won't use his name in case somebody knows, we called him Mighty Mouse. 
because on the basketball team, he was the shortest one on the team. Fast little fellow, though. I don't know how many times that boy spent the night over at our house, how many times my parents fed him. And he and his family knew that if he stayed over on the weekend, Sunday morning, we went to church. It's just what happened. And I don't know how many times my parents took him to church. Well, after high school and college, I lost him. He lost me. We, we had not communicated. One time we were able to go to a VBS at Bethlehem Church Christ. And there he sat. Same height as me now. His growth spurt was late with his wife, his two daughters. We talked for a moment. And he said, I'm sorry, I got to go. I'll talk to you after. I got to teach the high school class. Afterwards, I found out that they got married and they realized they wanted to get involved in church. And they thought back to Mr. Bob and Miss Jane. And they always took him to church at Rockwell Church of Christ. They started going to church and he was baptized, his wife was baptized, and today both his daughters are Christians. You see, we didn't get to see that seed that was planted by them, not by me, until later that not only did it grow, but it became a strong tree. We have to, brothers and sisters, plant seeds by being the light. This morning, if you're not yet a Christian, you don't think you can change the world, you're wrong. You can, one soul and person at a time. But first, you need to change yours. Come forward this morning, repent of your sins, confess your belief, be baptized for the forgiveness of those sins, and begin changing your life so that you can begin to change others. And if you are a Christian, if you need prayers, support, if there's anything we can do to help you, you come as we stand and sing.
song before the Lord's Supper this morning will be number 387. 387, Tell Me the Story of Jesus. We'll sing all verses of this song. 387. <clears throat> brothers and sisters. That's a phrase uh, I really like saying, brothers and sisters, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, maybe it's because I'm an only child, I'm not sure, but it's always given me uh, a lot of joy to, to say that phrase and to call somebody my brother or my sister. You know, I may be only, an only child in one sense, but uh, the day I was baptized, I gained millions of brothers and sisters. 
And while we may not be related by blood, uh, in a sense we are. We're all saved by Christ's blood, the blood he shed on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. And if you put on Christ through baptism, you have millions of brothers and sisters as well. Just this past Wednesday night, we gained a new sister in Christ as one of our teens had her sins washed away as she accepted the, uh, Jesus as her Lord and Savior. What a glorious night that was. Today she'll partake of the Lord's Supper for the first time with her Christian brothers and sisters. As we prepare our minds for this feast, uh, let's read a short passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. As we fulfill the command to eat and drink, let's keep our minds focused about the sinless and perfect life Christ lived and that made him a solution to our sin problem. Never forget the sacrifice he made for us that allows us to be brothers and sisters in Christ. Let's pray for the bread. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for today, so thankful for this time we have to gather here to, to worship and sing songs of praise to you, Father. It's now that we come before your throne asking you to, to be with us as we partake of this feast, as we partake of this bread which represents your son's body that was broken on that cross. We pray our, our hearts and our minds are in the right place. And everything we do is in, in your will. And it's through your son that we pray. Amen. Let's pray for the cup. Father, we love you so much. We're so thankful for your willingness to send your son to die. Father, we know it was agony on that cross, and we know that the spirit of the vine represents the blood that he shed for us so that we may have a hope in heaven one day for you. With you, Father, we pray we partake of this fruit of the vine in a way that's pleasing to you. And again, it's through your son that we pray. Amen. Separate from the Lord's Supper. Let's offer thanks for our blessings. Father, we're so thankful for all you do for us, Father, all the spiritual blessings you bestow upon us, all the physical blessings as well, Father. And it's, it's now that we'd like to give back a portion of that which you've blessed us with to you so that we may further your kingdom throughout the world. Father, continue to bless us with the health and the physical abilities we have to go out and earn livings for our families so that we may give back a portion to you. It's through it's your son that we pray. Amen. Closing song this morning will be numbered. Uh, well, will be a number. It'll be to the work. To the work. We'll sing all verses of this song. If you would please stand for this closing song. All verses. To the work. <clears throat> Thank you. 
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for this time that we've had to come together to worship you, to hear lessons from your word. Help us to take those lessons to heart. Help us to be the influence in this world that you would have us to be, to be the salt and the light, to improve the situations around us, to be a good example to others. Lord, we're so thankful for all the visitors we have and for all the events that we have planned for this summer. We pray that we can enjoy times of fellowship, times of happiness, times to grow closer to one another, and times to spread your word. Help all of our work to be according to your will, to follow your truth, to bring others to you. Be with us as we go out into the world. Help us to keep our lives pure and to spread your gospel. Please be with all those who are on the sick list. Bring them back to be with us as soon as possible. We're so thankful for the successful surgeries and healings that have occurred. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.